Hi, my name is Connie Vandersanden and I am a cash flow and business mentor. And I think it's time that we have real conversations with entrepreneurs about how they start their business and how money interacts with it. For way too long, it's all been about top line, making six to seven figures and really focused on that. The problem is, that's great. I mean, it's great to make that type of impact, but they're not. The money is not flowing through the business. They are not paying themselves. They are not contributing to social justice. They are not making impacts on their communities. And so it is less about what they're making and what they're doing with it. And that's why Fortune Fridays is here. We're going to talk to real entrepreneurs at different levels of their business, different industries. Uh, we might even bring in some experts to talk about money related issues. Uh, I just want to have more conversations so there will be less ick around money and more empowerment. So welcome to Fortune Fridays. I hope you enjoy them. <laughs> um, today, uh, my name is Connie Van Der Zanden, and today I have the privilege of talking with Morella DeVoe, um, who is a master healer of the heart, body, and mind. Since 2006, she has helped her clients transform physical and emotional pain into peace, joy, and personal power. Whether that's healing debilitating anxiety, trauma, or inherited ancestral wounds on the emotional level or on the physical level, IBS, Crohn's disease, and or arthritis, Morella's clients reclaim their right to thrive and to consciously start telling their greatest success stories. You have two master degrees in counseling from Columbia, um, a clinical hypnotherapist, an NLP master, an EFT practitioner, and Reiki master. That's a lot. It's a yeah. lot that you bring to the table. And she has a, a deep spiritual calling, a lifelong meditator, a longtime student of A Course in Miracles and Eckhart Tolle, and among other spiritual teachings. You are now in Vermont, where you're building a home and live there with your partner and daughter. So welcome, Marilla. Thank you, Connie. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. Um, yeah, thanks for coming out to talk with me today. Um, it was funny, it's, it's not funny, but um, in March, I always recognize Women's History Month uh, mm. in my blog, because um, I think it's important to know where our ancestors have been because it affects our money. And I, I did a timeline to look at all the things that have happened through our lifetime to get there. And, and a lot of people don't really understand how those traumatic experiences can land in our body and, and why they would still subconsciously be affecting money years and years later. The one piece I did forget to mention in March was also not only what was happening to our ancestors, but what was happening in the country, what was happening in the world as well, because it's a, a social, uh, yeah. social issue as well there. And that has a lot of dramatic effects on how we are eventually raised and around money. So I thought maybe it'd be interesting to talk about how to build our compassion muscle when everyone and everything around us is being triggered and affected all at the same time. Right. <laughs> and uh, how that um, by building our own muscle, we can become stronger leaders and able to support others. Um, yeah. And then how does that relate? Does that sound good? Yeah. Sounds okay. great. Awesome. So our goal is we're going to connect two points. We're going to connect self-compassion and trauma. Right. Right. And um, the, the main thing is we're going to recognize the connection so we stop beating ourselves up. Right. So, okay. So what I think for everybody, because trauma, they can understand trauma on a physical level, but what, it, what do you define trauma as? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and I think I, it's a really important question, and especially because trauma is becoming um, 
the more people are realizing that there's trauma in their history and, you know, and, and even as you mentioned in ancestral history. So the trauma that your parents or grandparents experienced is definitely passed on. And, you know, the field of epi epigenetics has now proven it that um, these very intense emotional experiences do get handed down. So trauma has become a bit more common uh, to talk about. However, I think a lot of people are misunderstanding what actually constitutes trauma and um, and that not everything that's being called trauma is actually trauma. And so I think it's really helpful to, to start with the definition of what actually is trauma, what constitutes trauma. Um, and, and I really, and I wanna make sure that we make the connection for people as to why us talking about trauma makes sense at this time and you know, how you, why you're making the connection with self-compassion. But to answer the question first, you know, trauma, you know, from a biologically, biologically and psychologically uh, point of view, from that, you know, biologically speaking, it is essentially the fight or flight response frozen in place. And so it is the result of someone having found themselves in a, a situation that produced intense fear where the natural fight or flight response was not able to be fulfilled. And so you can imagine this, say, in war veterans or assault victims or um, when somebody is all of a sudden in a very dangerous situation that there might be a very real fear for their life, for their safety, for their well-being, but then they're not able to either flee or fight. Um, and so... And it often, and this comes, you know, the, the two people who I'm, I have most studied in trauma are Bessel van der Kolk, the author of The Body uh, Keeps the Score, and uh, Peter Levine, who is the, who developed uh, somatic experience as a therapeutic um, approach for trauma. And he's written several books as well. And they have done an enormous amount of documenting how trauma and studying how trauma is essentially frozen in the body because this, all of this energy of the fight or flight response has no place to go. And Bessel van der Kolk points out, in addition, a critical component of trauma is that in that moment, the person feels helpless. Mm. There's a helplessness in that core helplessness like a helplessness and very often a sense of being like alone, forsaken. You know, it's like the, the, the soldier who's all of a sudden isolated from his unit under heavy fire, everybody's, you know, witnessing uh, horrific things and feeling completely alone and powerless and like God forsaken. And that that, um, will freeze, you know, it won't allow for the unfolding of the person successfully seeing the event through. Because, so, and for example, the, to contrast that, say, versus um, natural disasters, even though natural disasters, earthquakes, tsunamis, like all of these things can have the makings for severe trauma for people, because people often don't find themselves alone, um, people, the people, there, there's a, a collective factor that if people feel that they're in it together, uh, that they're, if there's a bonding and they can help each other kind of navigate the situation, there's usually not that kind of PTSD effect that, you know, trauma gets frozen in place. People have, you know, trauma effects afterwards when they're not able to fully resolve the, the situation. Does that make sense? It does. I had not thought of that in that way, but it, I show when we have, when we're in it together, there's a sense of resiliency. There's a sense of, of, uh, of group. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so in some, you know, what's fascinating, Bessel van der Kolk has studied this a lot. There's some indigenous cultures where when somebody has had a, a, a traumatic experience, the, the village will come around them and, you know, really help them kind of act it out. And this is the, the essence also of somatic experiencing is moving the person out of fight or flight by either helping them and supporting them to kind of like shake it off like an animal would or, you know, move through the natural resolution of the fight or flight 
response that's kind of frozen in the body. Okay. All right. So can money be a trauma then? (laughs) So much money trauma. Um, (laughs) And so it's funny because I had shared with you a story that was kind of my, my money traumas. And there are many forms of money trauma. I mean, if you think about situations where um, there's a fear for your safety, maybe fear for your well-being, uh, even maybe for your life. I mean, some people have money traumas that relate to abductions and, you know, ransom. And, you know, that's going to be tied to money. Um, when there's uh, a helplessness a uh, sense of aloneness that maybe you 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 can't solve this. There's a fear for your safety or your well-being. I'm going to lose everything, you know. Um, I mean, this money can even push people to commit suicide, right? You know, in these dire situations. And then I was going to say a third thing. Um, it'll come back to me. So when we have these intense experiences, there can absolutely be uh, money trauma. And so, you know, bankruptcy can become a money, money trauma for someone if they feel like they, they are helpless and they can't find a solution through it. You know, my personal story of um, my childhood money trauma that was kind of interesting that I shared with you, and, and I have now, I have another story that's kind of ancestral. When you mentioned ancestral, I'm like, oh, yeah, there's also ancestral money trauma. Kind of like a lot of people have the the uh, Great Depression kind of, you know, legacy, you know, that was traumatic and that people really couldn't, they couldn't get themselves out of the situation they were in, you know, it's kind of extended, kind of prolonged trauma in some respects. Um, So my personal story was when I was about seven or eight, and this is important for people to know that anything that happens in our early childhood before we're eight, when our our sense of self isn't fully formed and individualized away from our parents. We're in a really highly hypnotic state. And so everything we perceive, everything that we interpret from the world or we hear from our parents becomes very firm beliefs about reality and about the world, the way the world works. And so when I was, so this is an important thing to think about, you know, as it relates to money, what happened in your life in your early childhood up until the age of eight or so, of course, later experiences are, can also be, be, be very impactful, but that time is, is very it shapes you. So I woke up one morning in the middle of summer because I was, I wasn't uh, at school to the sound of my mom sobbing and my parents were divorced. My mother was always, you know, kind of struggling with money. My dad took, you know, took perfect care of me and provided child support and all of that. But my mother was always struggling. And uh, I woke up and she was sobbing in the dining room because she had saved money to buy her dream car, which was a Chevy Malibu of like 1980 or something like that. And she had rounded up all her money and she bought this car. And like three weeks later, it it was stolen, Mm -hmm. never to be found. And so the despair that my mother would, the enormous despair that my mother was feeling in that moment. And I, as her only daughter, it was such an intense experience of like, oh my God, are we not going to be safe? Is she not going to be safe? You know, and feeling completely powerless in my ability to solve it for my mother. Um, like, what are we going to do? And there's now this monumental loss. And of course, you know, I think my mother got over it quicker than I did. You know, she probably, she bought an another car, a used car, which was never the same. And so for years, we then had the memory of the car that got stolen because we had now had the second rape car that just was a lemon. Um, but that, what I, when I started working on this, on the source of like my money beliefs, they kind of came back to that moment where I felt it's always out of our control. There's some, there's some power out there that is bigger that has control over my mother's money and therefore my money and my well-being. Uh, there's nothing we can do about this. Um, and, and my mother struggled constantly. So there was this very intense belief is that her dreams would never come true and therefore mine would never come true. Right. And so it was, but that moment with that intense emotional reaction for her and then for me as a result really cemented that in place was that it just was not going to happen for us that dreams were not going to be 
happening, you know, for her or for me then as a consequence. Yeah. And also I wonder, I mean, other things to explore too, when people are, are looking at their own trauma is like your mom saved up her money to buy the car. And so there was probably something in her ancestral lines about not getting a loan or, or not trusting that system and that is saving up your money. And then all of a sudden it's gone. And then, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting how we unravel one thing and it can go all the way down. Right. Okay. So, yeah. And I have ancestral stories of my grandmother, her mom. And so, you know, we don't need to go down that rabbit hole, but, but that's exactly the point that you can go back and see, Oh, there's, there's a story of profound trauma. And my grandmother's childhood was horrific in terms of, of trauma for her on multiple levels. And the money one was a big one. Yeah. And so it came into my mother's story and then it came into my story. Yeah. The one thing I am noticing through all of this is that we're, especially when it comes to money is that that aloneness, but I, what's really covering it is the shame and guilt. That's what, why we feel alone when it comes to money, even though we'll put on a good face. You know, a lot of parents are, I had a single mom for a while as well with two kids. Um, so, but they have to put on that brave face, but it's a shame and guilt. I think that really are underneath that. And that must come from society in general. Yeah. And so somewhere down the line, the shame and guilt came in. And so we inherited it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. Huge money shame. It's like, um, and you know, the, my grandmother's story was all about shame. Um, and and money shame and not having it, not belonging. Um, and then, you know, that was my mother's story too, you know, not belonging, not having it, wanting, you know, so tons. And then when we don't have, it's amazing how, how much shame there is around money. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so I've always thought that it's, it's seven generations, but it sounds like it can go, it it goes back further. You have at least seven generations in your DNA. Mm -hmm. Um, but it really still, there's probably lingering even Pat earlier. Well, when, if if you think about that, the previous generation was seven generations back and the previous (laughs) one was seven generations back. I mean, it's endless, right? So yeah, in the DNA, we only have the seven generations, but we were shaped by the previous one. So yeah. I think because a lot of people want to think, well, I, I control it right now, or I, I'm only what my parents taught me or my grandparents taught me, but it's really, that's why I look at Women's History Month in March is that really to remind us of what's happened way before even um, what our living relatives might be able to, to tell us about. Um, yeah. So, okay, so trauma, trauma can land in the body differently. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, is is it just everyone is different where their trauma lands or is it money lands in a certain spot or it, what is that? What does that look like? How do people know? That's a really interesting question. Um, I don't believe that money lands in a particular spot. I mean, there is kind of a general, you know, the, the biological aspect of fight or flight is definitely the same for everyone, right? It's kind of an autonomic nervous system response. And so, you know, there's a certain pattern of breath and heartbeat and um, uh, blood pressure and, you know, the stopping of digestion. So some of the ways in which it can be common um, for, uh, you know, for trauma, especially like in if people have PTSD and it gets triggered, you know, they have something trigger their, 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 you know, whatever emotions, cocktail of emotions they feel in that moment. Um, you know, it can come with accelerated heart rate and, you know, shallow breathing and almost like for some people, like the beginning of a panic attack and that sort of thing. So that's kind of standard for everyone. However, um, you know, what, aspect like I'm working with a client right now who's a a refugee and his trauma um, gets triggered when he's in bed and it's dark and he's curled up in a kind of a fetal position because he had to hide and so you know so then he's discovered that he, if he lies in his room, it, totally dark in a fetal position, it kind of brings the body memory back alive. So, you know, there, what, how it can affect the body can be a number of ways. It's like what 
physiological or auditory or visual links there are in the subconscious mind with the trauma that then act as triggers. Then there's the pieces of the emotional expression that was frozen in place. Like I've had clients who's, um, for example, this one client who had Crohn's disease. And when we got, you know, diving into the emotional underpinnings of his Crohn's disease, it was the trauma of three, um, like, uh, deaths in his family, uh, very traumatic deaths in his family, totally unexpected and how he could not, he had to hold it together for the family. So all of his emotions, all of the grief, all of the pain, it's like, I said to him one day, it's like you swallowed it all. And he said, that's exactly it. I swallowed it. And it was totally exploding in his intestines. And he's like, that's exactly what it feels like. Um, For other people, you know, the gripping, you know, can lead to joint problems, uh, migraines. So it's like, if you think about the, the amount of energy of these emotions in the moment and this frozen fight or flight response that doesn't get an outlet, all of those emotions, it's like this, I mean, all of this energy looks for an outlet for expression. And usually what that is, is what I call the, the Achilles heel of DNA. If in your family, there's this a propensity for IBS, that's probably where it's going to express itself. If in your family, you know, there's a history of Crohn's disease or arthritis, or, you know, um, for me, it was acne, you know, my trauma exploded on my face. So my unresolved um, uh, trauma from a sexual assault exploded on my face when I had as when I for the 10 years that I didn't realize that that was what my acne was. So um, where it manifests is can be very closely linked with that, you know, kind of DNA Achilles heel of what your inheritance is. And sometimes it can be a very kind of I don't know if I want to call it literal or metaphorical, but it's like, you know, the person who was afraid of, you know, having their, their head cut off. And so, you know, they've got all of this pain and anxiety in their shoulders and their neck from, you know, the fear that they're, um, so it can be very literal, right? Yeah. Okay. So it's kind of, that's why it makes sense when we're um, trying to put a bandaid on it like people go meditate, go journal, mm-hmm. but it's, it's really that we're needing to address these traumas on multiple levels. Um, so I, the purpose of, of what I wanted to get on was one is that people would recognize that some of these things that are going on with money are, are traumas that are, are in your body, in your, um, in your physical body and in your emotional body. And I wanted to give them a way of like, okay, what are the, the next steps? What are two or three things that they could do to do that? Um, and you have a way for them to take this to uh, an additional level. And because I think that's the key is like, how do you tie everything together, right? That's why trauma doesn't actually leave until we're able to tie it all together. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there's even growing, um, you know, I've, I've found my, my way, my path in my work, you know, as a hypnotherapist and counselor and, um, doing also neuro-linguistic programming where, and I think that this is what all of the effective strategies for trauma are showing is there has to be, it's beyond the level of just talking about it and thinking about it, because a lot of people know that they have an experience of trauma and knowing about it at, at the rational level doesn't mean that it all of a sudden it's like, okay, done. Yeah. Right. Um, and I could get us on a soapbox about that. So I'm not going to, um, but you know, all of these different strategies that are working for trauma, um, uh, have some element of either, um, sensory or, um, physiological resolution, either through actual body movement, like in somatic experiencing, um, or like in EMDR, there's an engagement with sensory stimulus that engages the subconscious mind in a different way. You know, neuro-linguistic programming does it in the same, you know, in a similar way as well. So like you're saying, we're connecting all of the layers and also providing resolution for the trauma, you know, for that fight or flight response that got frozen in place and helping it's almost like helping the psyche move out of that frozen place. Mm -hmm. And so what you're, what you're starting to mention as to what I, what I do, 
One of the, and this is something I want to share with our, our viewers and um, a lot of people in my community have gone through this process is um, a seven step. It's actually like six days. And then the seventh day is like, you know, the, the final step or what comes next. But over the course of six days, um, facilitating for people what I call the getting to the heart of the issue process. And so it's like peeling back the layers. So we start with a, you know, at the first step, which is the, often the misstep is, first of all, you want to envision where you want to go. So if you know you're stuck in a situation, whether it's physical or it's money wise, right? So you know that you've been stuck in the situation with your money for eons, right? And it just seems like the pattern that never changes. Yeah. You want to get clear on where you want to go, right? A lot of people have their vision boards, but sometimes it's it's really helpful to like get really clear on what do you want it to look like? But then the next step, so in the next few steps are really about peeling the layers of what is the situation? How has this trauma shaped your current situation? And you start looking at what are the symptoms? So it's like my checkbook is always in the red, you know, I've got all this credit card bills, you know, um, I'm always afraid of whatever the symptoms, the outer, outer symptoms might be. Uh, I've never, I can never break six figures or, you know, the minute that I break six figures, then I have, you know, $20,000 in repairs, you know, it's like all of these are, what are the symptoms? Then the next layer is looking at the emotional level. What are the emotions and often I, so I say, look at what are the emotions you have about the symptoms? And this gets really interesting because oftentimes the emotions that we have about the symptoms, we think that they're the result when in reality, it's often the other way around. Oh. The emotions tend to keep the symptoms in place. And so, and then when you kind of peel it back, you realize that you were feeling the emotion way before the symptoms started. So shame, for example shame, embarrassment, guilt, pain, frustration, all of these things, there was a whole lot more shame before you ever got, you, know, you ever got started on the money journey, more than likely, right? So emotions, then we peel the layer back and we start looking at the beliefs and thoughts underneath that. And um, the next layer, you know, what are all the messages, all the things that you think are true? Uh, what did you hear from your family? What did you learn from your dad? What did you learn from your mom? And then go back into um, life events and then trailing like how all of these pieces connect to the different life events. And it was doing this exercise that I actually found the story of the, of the stolen Malibu and like oh my god there was this time when my mom and then I realized holy smokes no what you know that's the first recollection I have of ever feeling totally powerless about money that it was totally out of my control yeah. it didn't start when I was 33 and trying to figure out my business right it was you know so so then we go back into the you know, and this is all like facilitated with a worksheet you know each day and so it just guides people and then we go under the surface into the ancestral stuff and really starting to dig. Well, even before my mom's ma stolen Malibu story, you know, there was my grandmother's story of, you know, being orphan and, you know, not in she and her siblings not having anything to eat, yeah. you know? So there's like all of these, um, all of these layers. So we start looking at all of that. And then that's just kind of the beginning where you, where you can see all of the layers and identify how they're, how they're showing up and, and also connected to, you know, how's it showing up in your body? How to it, maybe even in your relationships and all of that from then the, from there, the work does get deeper. Um, and so um, we probably, we're probably out of time, but I'm happy to, <laughs> to share this um, either in an email or share it later. Cause then there's another writing exercise. I don't know. I just think it would be a disservice to try to do it too quickly, but there's a three-step writing exercise that I use to help people um, start turning uh, it's like start claiming their power back from a painful story or a painful memory. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think this seven steps that you have in the witch work, we'll put a link to it. So it's getting to the heart of the issue. I think that's the first, because awareness is the first step mm -hmm. is um, 
of course, if you're watching this video, you've already taken, you've already dipped your toes in, you already are recognizing that there is something, something that's keeping money from flowing. And so you're exploring different options, but the, the journaling prompts that you'll give over the seven days and the getting to the heart of the issue is, um, is their first step. And then what, what I would recommend is if you want to take this further is um, that Morella has a YouTube channel and of course she does her uh, initial consultation so that you can find out more of what that would look like. Because I do think once it's not something we can always do on our own, right? It, it's, we, it's helpful to have another party, just like when you're doing your financial plan in your business or something, it's helpful to have a, another party who's not emotionally attached to the situation that can have a, a, a different view from it and facilitate the process. Um, but it doesn't have to be a long-term thing for healing trauma. Yeah. No, yeah. no, and a, a, not at all. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I thank you very much for a sharing uh, your, your trauma story around money and also giving our listeners uh, or watchers um, more information on the fact that there is money trauma and how it shows up in the body, where it's come from. It's not just, um, the generations that we might be living with us, but our ancestors and yes. I just, something I wanted to mention because as you're saying, you know, there is money trauma and I kind of stayed on the subject of money related trauma. However, there are all sorts of other trauma that affect our money, even if they weren't related to money in the first place. Oh, so for example, uh, any sort of like any sort of experience that affects your kind of sense of worthiness, your sense of self, your sense, because, you know, our relationship with money and, and how money shows up in our life in, in many ways is a reflection to us of our sense of worthiness and our, and our ability to receive. And so it's important to mine your life and your ancestral stories to find what are the money pieces, literally money related pieces that could be showing up. But um, sometimes they weren't about money at all. And there was a profound experience of childhood trauma or whatever it was where it really um, ate away at the sense of self and the sense of worthiness and this, you know, ability to receive. And, you know, if you don't feel worthy, you can't receive an abundance of money because you, you just, you don't know how to. Yeah. So yeah. I wanted to mention that. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. That's good. It's a good ending part because yeah, it's, it is important. And I usually in, in any coaching, if you, if you have your business and you go get business coaching, you usually start at that when you do pricing and thing is, is that worthiness. I'm not worthy. I want to hide. I want to, so we're using the words to do that in our business. And maybe we should thank our business for bringing that to light. Because <laughs> if, if we were all still employees, we might not have this awareness. So, so. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Morella. Again, uh, we'll put all the links below, but you can also check her out at thrivewithmorella.com. And that's M-O-R-E-L-L-A.com. So thank you. Thank you, Connie. This was, this was fun and a pleasure to share. Great.